You know, on uh, Sunday morning, uh, how many of you, I guess, see me pace back and forth a few times back there? It's kind of my preparation for getting up here because I'm scared to death. Uh, I'm not. That's, that's serious, actually. Uh, so it's a grace of God that I come up here and speak to you all. I also hear from the Lord back there. The music, the worship, you know, that's a preparation for us to hear from God. How many pray before they read their Bible in the mornings? God, speak to me today. God, show me where you want me to go. I'm checking in with the commander in chief. Just as if you would check into your boss at work. Hey, what's my job for today? What, what's my assignment you check in with the teachers. Proverbs 31 came to mind this morning. He says here in verse 10, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. I have a wonderful wife. God's grace in her life is evident because she's living with me. <laughs> I am not a perfect person. I blow it from time to time to time to time. But Margaret is an inspiration, encouragement. She is a blessing to me. And so I just wanted to thank her this morning for that. What book we in? Anybody know? First Timothy. We began last week taking a look at this book, a book that Paul wrote to a young believer, a young man that he took under his wings. He discipled and he gave him some instructions. Paul is at the end of his life here in writing these letters, passing on the torch, passing on some instructions, some encouragement, some commands to this young man to teach the church, to share with the church. And that's what we're looking at over these next few weeks. And it's for us today as well. The book, this book is written for us today. It is timeless there isn't Bible 2 coming out, by the way. <laughs> and so this book here is for our correction. It's for us today. And the first task that Paul charges Timothy with, with, as we looked at last week, is to guard the faith, guard the gospel. And to do that, you sometimes need to silence the false teachers, ones that are sharing a different gospel a different way to get to God, a different way to get to heaven. And that's here today, is it not, in our society? And so we need to silence that, and we need to correct it and teach the truth. And secondly, we looked at how the law is sometimes looked at as a standard we are to live by. The Ten Commandments were the law, so to speak. But they were never intended for them to be a standard of life because guess what? You cannot live up to them. The law was presented, was given to us to show us how wretched we are. They were to lead us to Christ, to show us that we are sinners, that we're condemned. We are sinners in need of a Savior. 
But in our instruction today, Paul also knows that instruction sometimes isn't enough. And sometimes we need some models. We need some examples to look at, to emulate, to imitate their faith. What does a model do? You got a model that walks down the runway? What's, what, what are they sporting? What are they showing you? A fashion, a look. It's something you can see. And we have models in our lives in different areas, don't we? Models of parenting. There are parents in our midst that are great models that we are to imitate. Models of a Christian life, of following God, of trusting God, of walking with God, of being faithful to God. And we're going to see today that Paul sets himself up as a model, as an example to you and I of how to live the Christian life. How to receive God's grace. So this morning in verses 12 through 20 of chapter 1, we're now going to turn from Timothy's instruction or the work that he was given to do, so to speak, to Timothy's model. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Let's praise you, God, for being here with us. Thank you for the worship, Lord. I wrote down, Lord, have your way in me today. Have your way through me today, Lord, as your speaker, as one who is up here just sharing what I know, what I understand, what you've shown me, what your word says, Lord. I pray that my words, my attitude, my examples, Lord, would be accurate, would be inspirational, would be encouraging, would be challenging, would be even convicting, Lord. That's a job of your Holy Spirit. And so I pray, Father, that we be filled with your Holy Spirit today, this morning, to hear your word accurately. Do you want to know him more? I pray that that would be our desire this morning. That this not just be another routine hour on a Sunday morning. but that we truly want to know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. The setting for the message this morning is found in verses 12 through 17 primarily. We're going to touch briefly on 18, 19, and 20, but the... But the, but the uh, The main points are going to be in these five or six verses. And I'd like to read that text to you if you're not familiar with it. So you have it in your mind as we look at it together. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. I want to stop right here for a second and make a few comments. I want us to notice a little phrase here that is very relevant, very important, very substantial in our understanding when it comes to understanding sound doctrine. Correct teaching, accurate belief system. It's a little phrase that Paul uses five different times in his pastoral letters. As a pastor, as a leader of the church, he's instructing and he uses this phrase five different times to emphasize something, to make a strong point. Anytime we see uh, repetitive words, repetitive phrases in the Bible, pay attention to them.
I mentioned last week that in these two letters, there is three tap roots, three roots that you and I, to remain strong in the Lord, to run the Christian life to its fall. We need to go deep in these three roots. The first one was accurate beliefs. We're going to see that time and time again is that you need to understand and I need to understand that there is correct doctrine. The second is that you and I have to be involved with spiritual practices. There's got to be some training Things put into practice, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, sharing your faith, all those things are necessary to keep you strong when the storms come. And the third element, the third root that you and I need is just Christian community, relationships, people that come alongside, people that knock on our door when we need them to knock on our door, people that carry us when we're down, we're discouraged. You and I need that. Verse 15, here is a trustworthy, faithful, true saying that deserves full acceptance. You can bank on this statement that I'm about to share with you. It is accurate. You can trust it. There is no doubt whatsoever about what I'm going to tell you. Without question, it is an accurate statement. It's worthy. It's highly valued. It should be believed. It should be affirmed. It should be accepted. It's worthy to be understood and fully practiced. And here it is. You ready? Here's the statement that's true. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. <laughs> that's the statement. He wants you and I to understand. There's no quabbling here. There's no, there's no mixing of words here. Every word is chosen carefully, and it's a summation of the gospel. In these nine Greek words, you can, you can sum it up as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, Christ Jesus came. It's interesting, and I won't go into all the, all the particulars, but Paul uses Christ Jesus rather than Jesus Christ 47 times to five. Christ, he understands the... Jesus is the Christ. Christ is the anointed one. He's the king. He's the supreme one. He puts him first here. He's the Messiah. That's who he is. And guess what? He came into our world. He was somewhere else. And he came into our world. The anointed king, God in the flesh, came to our world. The Gospel of John says it this way. John repeatedly speaks of the fact that Christ came into the world. John 1.9, he was the true light, lighting every man who came into the world the world. In chapter 3 of John's gospel, verse 19, light is come into the world. What's our world full of? Pain, darkness, suffering. Do you guys want to go there? <laughs> Would that be a place of your choice? A world of sinners, a realm of unbelief, hostility toward God. And it says that God sent his son into the world 
not only to condemn the world, but in 3.17 of John, he says, but that the world through him might be saved. Might be saved. You'll notice that it specifically says that Christ Jesus came in the world to save. To rescue is literally what that word means. To deliver us out of darkness and death and hell and condemnation. Matthew 1 21, for he shall save his people from their sins. Luke 19 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save, rescue, pull out of the pit, which was lost. Save means to deliver, to rescue, to bring up. And who did he come to save? Who did he come to save? Sinners. Who's a sinner in our midst today? If he came for you, stand up. If he came for you today, stand up. You can sit down. The very purpose that God had in mind was the redemption of sinners, was to bring us to himself, Verse 12 begins with thanks, and verse 17 ends with praise. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Christ Jesus. Praise you. Praise you. Verse 16, but for that very reason that Jesus came to save sinners, for that very reason... Paul says, I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. How many of you are, are, have ever been amazed at God's saving power? God's saving grace. It's amazing, isn't it? I like the story of the Elka Indians that came to mind this week with Jim Elliott in his martyrdom visiting a savage group desiring to share the gospel with him and they took his life. But in that, God used it. His wife and others went back to this group after the gospel was shared and many of them came to know Jesus Christ. Yes, a life lost for the sake of eternal life. I've read about Billy Sunday. A drunken baseball player walking down the street after a game with a bunch of his buddies. And there's some goofball on the corner preaching the gospel. And they're all making fun of him. <laughs> like of that kook. But something this guy said that caught Billy's attention. <laughs> Touched a chord in his heart. And he told his friends to go on. And he talked with this guy, and this guy led him to the Lord. Billy has been, it's been said of him that he was one of the greatest evangelists in the 20th century. Great transformation. I read a story about Ty Cobb. Anybody ever heard of Ty Cobb? Baseball player. <laughs> and at the end of his life, gave his life to Jesus Christ. 
And he said this, I came to Christ in the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> I could have only have wished that it was in the top of the first. <laughs> wow. We can open this book right here and find one right after another of amazing stories. Account after account of God's saving grace. I highlighted a few in my Bible. We read about a demon-possessed maniac whom Jesus spoke and drew the demon out of this man and he came to know Christ. Worshiping Christ clothed in his right mind, it says. And then I read, read about Matthew, a despised tax collector whom came to know the Lord and wrote the gospel of Matthew. The crowds of people that Jesus won to himself. The story of blind Bartimaeus and his friend who were healed and brought to Christ through salvation. The man born blind and the adulterous woman at the well. The leper who returned to say thanks and the sinner who beat on his breast. Zacchaeus in the tree, of whom it was said, this day is salvation, come to your house. The centurion who saw that it was the son of God. How about that thief who was hanging on the tree? Jews at Jerusalem, when Peter preached and Cornelius and the eunuch came to know Christ. Philippian jailer, Lydia, the list goes on and on and on. Is your name on that list? How about your story? How did God transform your life? Was it amazing? I've shared my story a time or two. It's amazing how God got a hold of my life. It's sad in one sense to know the extent that God had to go to to get my prideful attention. The death of one of my children got my attention. The loss of a job, something I pride myself in, don't we guys? got my attention. A brother who risked our friendship, our relationship to share the gospel with me. I surrendered. <laughs> Can we just sing that song? I surrendered. I'm done, God. Give my life to you. I don't know what it's going to entail. I don't know where I'm going to be going. I don't know what I'm going to be done. What's your story? And here in these pages of scripture, we have the testimony of one who called himself what? <laughs> the chief of sinners. You think you guys sin? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> And he was so thrilled with sharing his story, his testimony, that he repeated it over and over and over again in, our, in the Word. Here's the accounts. You can write them down if you like. You can look them up. Luke wrote it in chapter 9. Paul repeated in chapter 9 of Acts. Paul repeated in his testimony in Acts 22. He repeated it again in Acts 26. He repeats it in Galatians 1 and 2. Repeats it in Philippians 3, and now again he repeats it here in 1 Timothy, sharing his story. Huh. When was the last time you shared your story of how God saved you? Of all the specifics, when was the last time you looked back? 
It's an example, it's a model of you, what you and I should be doing. In one sense, sharing what God is doing and has done in your life. It was always a marvelous, amazing thing to Paul that Jesus saved me. Are you excited about your salvation as much now as you were than when you first got saved? Or has it waned? Oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I wonder what we're having for lunch. I wonder what tomorrow's going to hold. I wonder if God's going to provide next week. Oh, yeah, thanks, God, for salvation. What, what's your attitude? What does it look like? Sharing our story renews our thankfulness. <laughs> renews our gratefulness for what God has done. There's power in sharing the gospel, isn't there? It reestablishes what we believe, what we understand. And so this is Paul's testimony to that grace. It's something that you and I need to pass on. We need to share with others. I want to take just a few minutes here to point out six elements of grace, what grace is, how it's packed into these four or five verses Six things of what grace is. I want to give us a definition. It's a long one. You ain't going to write it down, but you can get the podcast. You can look and watch this message again and get the specifics if you want. But here is grace in a nutshell. Grace is God's loving forgiveness. It's exemption from judgment and promise of temporal and eternal blessings given to guilty and condemned sinners freely without any worthiness on the part and based on nothing they have done or failed to do. Did you get that? I'll say it one more time. Grace is God's loving forgiveness Exemption from judgment and promise of temporal and eternal blessings given to guilty and condemned sinners freely without any worthiness on their part and based on nothing they have done or failed to do. That's grace. It's God's free and undeserved merit. Unearned forgiveness and favor. Six elements of grace quickly. The first one is that there's a source of grace in our portion this morning. Where does grace come from? Look at verse 12. It says here that Paul says he is thankful. He says to Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does he direct his thanks here to Christ Jesus? Because he's the source. I thank Christ Jesus for this grace. That's the source of grace. And over in verse 14, he actually says it. And the grace of our Lord. That's where grace comes from. That's the source of it. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's one element of grace. The second is that in our portion, there's a need for grace. You and I need God's grace. In verse 13, the need is very clear here. Before Paul's conversion, it says that he was something. He was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. What were you? What were you before God saved you? What kind of person were you? Why did you need God's grace? Fill in the blank. The grace of God is so vivid in Paul's mind because of what he used to be. Of what he was. I was a blasphemer. <laughs> I took God's name in vain. 
I was against him totally. I told people they were crazy. I persecuted him. I put him in jail. I put some of them to death. I was a violent man. Boy, did I need grace. That's what he's saying here. A great sinner has to be given great grace. <laughs> Much grace. This is the need for grace. Paul was a desperate sinner. So great was the need. It leads us to the third element of grace in our portion today, and it's the power of grace. The power of grace was evident because of the need. <laughs> Verse 13, I was shown mercy. That's the power of grace. You didn't deserve it, but God showed mercy. Do you see that in your own life? Did you need mercy? He was smeared with mercy all over him. God says, I know what you were. But I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm going to be gracious to you. What about the measure of grace in our portion? Is there a measure? Is there an amount? How much is there of grace? Verse 14, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Abounding, much. One portion said it super abounded. <laughs> Beyond measure. And Paul was saying, I've got a lot of sin, so I need a lot of grace. <laughs> and God is able to make all grace abound, it says in Corinthians. There's more than enough. God's grace is sufficient. The fifth element here in this portion is there's a purpose of grace. There's a purpose for it. And the perfect purpose was to save sinners was to bring us back to God. Got an interesting thought here. Why did God save Paul? Why did God appear to Paul on the Damascus road? Was it so that he wouldn't go to hell? Perhaps, but not going to hell is a benefit of being saved in one sense. It's something you're not going to. Was it to get him into heaven? Well, again, that's a benefit of being saved. Perhaps it was to display to the world <laughs> that none of us that no one else, here you've got the chief of sinners, the worst of sinners. If God can save him, huh, he can save anybody. There's nothing that you have done that's worse than what Paul did. Was it to put God on display? Here's what I'm able to do. Look at verse 16. Paul says this. I was shown mercy so that in me, in my life, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. It puts God on display of how good God is, how great God is. As an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Was that one of the reasons he saved Paul? And the sixth element that we see here about grace is the response to his grace. It's in verse 17, now to the king eternal. 
the immortal king, the invisible king, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What's your response to grace? Is it praise? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, for dying for me. Thank you, Father. Thank you for forgiving me. Is it praise? And the last thought I have here in these last three verses is the Christian life is a long term, is a marathon race. It's not a one time thing. There's a process here. There is warfare going on. How many are feeling warfare in their life? You wonder if it's all caveman in. You wonder who's going to be against you next. You wonder what's going to happen next. It's part of life, isn't it? There's no exit to run to in the Christian life. What else is out there that measures up to the grace of God? What's the alternative? Go back to the life that you had? Keep on keeping on. Go deep in your understanding, in your relationship, your walk with God. Verse 18, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you may fight the good fight. How many are in a fight? How many are in the ring right now? How many are struggling with life, with what's being thrown at you? So that you may fight the good fight holding on to the faith, following Jesus Christ, being connected to the vine, being in Christian community. In a good conscience, some have rejected these. Some have gone out the door and done their own thing. Anybody know anybody? How is it going for them? Some have rejected these and so have been shipwrecked. Their faith has been shipwrecked. They've thrown it all away. Doesn't work. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. We may touch on that next week, what that means. If you're a Christian here this morning, you ought to be thankful. It ought to show. People ought to know it. And if you're not, if your thankfulness has grown cold, maybe you go, need to go back to remember. <laughs> remember what you were like. Remember how it was before Christ entered your life. You need to reach back and remember that old way of life. Share your story. That's my challenge for this morning. Sometime this week, find someone, find an opportunity, make an opportunity to share your story. How did God become real to you? Who was it that shared the gospel with you? How did that moment happen? When did that happen? Where did that happen? Who did it happen with? And if you have not embraced Jesus Christ, maybe you've heard the truth, maybe you've heard the gospel, but you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you need to do that. Now is the day for salvation, it says, not tomorrow. We don't have tomorrow. You know that? All we have is right now. That's the message. 
That's the message this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you, Christ Jesus, Christ, the anointed one, the king, the supreme being, the creator, the almighty came to earth, came into our world to save us from death, from hell, Lord. Not only eternally, but here, Lord. We can live a life here with joy and promise and a purpose that affects those around us. I pray, Father, that you, through your Holy Spirit, make us alive again if we're not. That we be excited about your work and our life and the grace and your faithfulness. God, you, it, you have and are what we need. I pray that we'd be people that display that, that share that, that exude that, that communicate that. And so we need your help this week, Father, to share our story, to make it a, a plan, to make it a priority. Thank you for your word this morning in Jesus' name.